Okay, Professor Kraft, before you start your report, I should give you, I should give a brief introduction of you. Is that okay? Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, hello everyone. I'm very glad to chair this seminar. I'm Wang Dongzhong from Tian University. It's our great honor to invite Professor uh, Marcus Kraft to give a report. Uh, Professor Kraft is a fellow of Churchill College, Cambridge, and professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. He's the director of CRES Limited, the Singapore Cambridge Create Research Center. He's also a principal investigator of Cambridge Center for Carbon Reduction in Chemical Technology. Uh, the report of Professor Kraft will give us today is uh, universal, uh, universal digital twin, the impact of heat pumps on social inequality. Okay, let's welcome Professor Kratz to give us the report. Right, hello everyone. Great right. to be here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, so let me, do, let me go right into it. Um, I guess the one reason uh, for me to give this talk is to also uh, uh, raise some awareness of a paper that has been published in Advances in Applied Energy. Um, this is this new um, high quality journal by Professor Dean uh, Young, and um, who you, I'm sure, know very well. And um, so I will report about this paper, but also the bigger context this paper was written in. And um, but before I do that, um, I just want to remind you that I actually normally sit in Singapore, although today I'm actually speaking to you from Germany. And um, so I've been in Singapore since 2013. And what you see on this photograph, that is Jurong Island. This is one of the biggest chemical industrial parks uh, that exist. Um, and one of our aims was to look into possibilities how to reduce the CO2 emission. However, I'm also a professor in Cambridge and what you see is the website of my um, research group, the Como group, and um, some of my current and former students. So we have a Christmas dinner every year and this is the beautiful um, Christmas dinner so I'm, I can wear uh, proper clothing um, if need be, right? So, but I have another hat. Um, um, the Director of Computation Modeling in Cambridge and Computation Modeling in Pirmasens GmbH. This is where I am now, actually. Um, this is also my hometown. This is the commercial branch of our, um, of our activities. And um, so what we do do is try to solve a problem. Now, of course, there are many problems in the world, as you know. Um, so let, let, let's look at one specific one that is relevant for reducing CO2 emissions, but many other relevant uh, consequences. So um, the context is industry 4.0. I'm not sure um, how much you have heard this buzzword. I assume most of you have. Um, you go to different stages of industrial development and currently we are in um, uh, industry 4.0, that means we have the Internet of Things, cyber physical systems, and Internet of Services, and basically machines talking to one another. By the way, can you hear me properly? Yes, you can. Can you hear me? Do you understand what yes. I'm saying? Yes, we can. Okay, great. <laughs> so now let's, let's have a look. Um, industry 4.0, what actually means okay so we go from digitization to digitalization there's a difference okay so the internet of things is interconnecting numerous devices and sensors and you have ubiquitous computing and smart devices of which have your mobile phones okay and um, then you have the internet of services <coughs> so that means that you have uh, you have to have the integration of heterogeneous environment um, a service could be an app on your mobile phone, or it could be a specific software that runs in a, in a technical piece of kit. And um, some of those will be actually in, in cloud computing. 
However, you will then see that there are some obstacles at the moment. And I'm sure everybody who is using different printers and uh, knows about this. And this is about the heterogeneity of data and the heterogeneity of devices and services. And, and this, um, this problem um, that data cannot be exchanged, software cannot um, work properly, this is um, part of the, um, what we now want to look at and present the solution to. And in our view, the solution is based on knowledge graph, but that, that actually is almost mis misleading. What I want to present here is the, what we call the universal digital twin or the world avatar. Okay. Now, um, so what does the world avatar do? It aims to represent, and now this is important, any aspect of the real world in a digital world. From a general purpose and all encompassing data storage and modeling framework. And it contains concepts and data that describe the real world that are operated by, on by computational agents. <coughs> so what we want is not a specific problem solver, but we want to build a general problem solver. Okay, so knowledge graph, what is this? Um, now you have to know that this technology that we've been using is uh, used by many people every day, including yourself. So if you look at the Google website, then you see um, uh, knowledge graphs are used for categorization of search results, embedded user experiences, different sources, auto-generated knowledge panels, linkage from different platforms. So this is what Google's graph does. And so if we want to uh, do that for the world as such, not just for the data accessible to Google. So if you take even a further step back, make it more general, then you look at what we call the world avatar. And the world avatar um, is a distributed directed graph and that ha it has in common with the knowledge graph. It has concepts and instances, okay? And a concept, for example, is a table, you know, right in front of you, you know, I bang my hand on the table right now. So what is a table? Table is a, we use the word table as a concept, but then you have a specific table in front of you, that is an instance. And now this instance has properties. So for example, a location. So if you go and move the table in your room, then the instance of the table has changed using the concept of table and location, right? And the person who moved the table could be looked at as an agent, okay? And now that same thing happens, okay? You describe here the agent. The green bit is a bit like the hard disk and the red bit is a bit like your memory. So you have input agents, you have composite agents, atomic agents, discovery agents, and all sorts of things. So it's a whole uh, variety and, is, um, of, of agents. The properties of this directed knowledge graph are very attractive. It's unambiguous, it's connected, scalable, it's distributed, it's accessible, it's able to multi-domain interoperable, and it is, it is evolving in time. Just as your brain contains a world model that moves and changes over time. So for example, you know, um, in your brain, the position of the table in your room has now been updated because you have moved it. Okay, that needed to be stored and the same is happening in the world of time. So, right, so that's, that's the motivation. That's what we are um, trying to do. So, just a repetition, the world avatar offers a solution that aims the integration of different types of model and data, improving interoperability between heterogeneous data formats and software. Representation of the real world infrastructure are stored and related items and related items linked and integrated with computational agents that describe the behavior of the real world system. Okay, so it's a natural design of the universal digital twin. You could argue it's the the mother of all digital twins. Okay? So what can you do with it? Now, the first thing, the first application I would like to show you was a, a website called Marie. Um, here, that 
website's purpose is to access chemical information um, over and above what, for example, Google can or PubChem can. Um, this work website is in, in um, development. Um, we can already do some things Google cannot do, but we also lag behind in a few other things, for example, the interpretation of natural language. Um, that is not quite as robust and fast as we would like to see it, but um, you have already um, some very interesting um, aspects of it. Then secondly, we have a rep representation of the gas pipelines and gas terminals, including their actual um, state. Um, here you see a time series of one of the, uh, of the Easington terminal. Um, so that gives you an idea that what I call the base world is represented as a whole. You know, not only chemical molecules are in it, but also the gas pipeline infrastructure of the UK. But also its land use, you know, what crops can you find where? So now imagine you were operating um, a biorefinery and you needed um, some biomass, say um, spring wheat, um, oil seed uh, that are all suitable for your biorefinery, then you could use an agent that basically says, okay, how far do I have to go to source my demand um, in these particular crops? And, um, and this is what you see here um, with the circles. Um, so also a, a, a representation of the base. Well, but then, um, of course, of particular interest are buildings. And buildings can be represented at different levels of detail. And this is actually Norfolk um, in the UK, that's um, north of Cambridge. And what you see here are buildings represented at level of detail one, that's the most simple representation, just extrusion of uh, the floor of the building. However, okay, you can have buildings extruded uh, form from LOD2. Um, and you cannot only have a few buildings like this. <laughs> but um, here we have buildings um, that contain the whole of Berlin. <laughs> so that is sort of quantity. And if we move on to level of details four, you have a building that um, can be represented in terms of different um, flats and what, with it, what is within the flats. Here you have an overlap between um, the city description and what, what's called the building information model. And I will say more to this. But we can also look at traffic. And here, um, this is a snapshot of Singapore's marine traffic. And all these ships have now also been instantiated so the world avatar knows where the ships are. Um, this is from a, a public domain data source. And now you could, of course, argue what impact have, have these ships on, um, in terms of air quality on Singapore. So and in order to do this, you know, we created what's called a virtual sensor. So you have to have a concept of the ship. You have to have concept of weather and wind and rain. You have to have concept of building. I've already shown this. You have to have concept of the internals of, of a reactor. In this case, a ship could be viewed with its engine as a, as a, as a chemical transformation of energy into, into power. And of course, if there's combustion going on, you need to understand the chemistry uh, that happens within that reactor and we use our chemistry information. You have to have an agent that simulates what this engine does. And you have to have an agent that knows how these emissions from a ship disperse into space, given the, the corresponding weather. And what I show you now is uh, it's exactly that. You see the black dots are the ships and they've been moving. And um, so uh, you can then basically over time get an idea um, of how these ships um, 
impact on the air quality, say, in the financial district of Singapore. Right. Let's move on. But as I said to you, um, you can, of course, ask questions, but imagine you have everything connected and the system knows what these things are. Then, of course, you can create agents that also actuate a certain machine because you may not only be able to read, you may also be able to write, okay? So, and this is what I say, control the base world. So the world avatar can actually operate on the base world. And let's show you how we did this. And for that, um, you now see um, the digital permanent, which is actually my hometown. Um, this is where I sit at the moment. And, um, and, so what you see here is the city and um, its main water distribution network. So these are the pipes, um, all in cesium. You can see that there is elevation um, in, 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 in this pipe network. This is very important because we have to pump um, fluid from different places to another places. And um, so you can also then look at the housing. So these houses that you'll see in a second, they are at level of detail two. You see now um, they down here, they are now just filled in into visualization. The red bits are the roofs that will be important to calculate, for example, uh, um, the amount of PVC cells, solar power um, that you can obtain from these buildings. So this is, uh, I'll get to that a bit later. And um, with that representation, hold on, this is the second time, same thing. Um, we've been able to create an agent that operates the district heating network. Um, and what you see here is data from 2019 before COVID and um, our, agent was able to outperform the manual operation and save up to 20% um, of the overall cost um, of operating this network. So here clearly um, an incentive to push this technology a bit further. But as I told you, the world has different scales and different world is, uh, complex and has many, many different things in it. So you could start trying to represent this or try to come up with concepts that describe different areas. So here I've already told you something about Marie. You can then think uh, these are the molecules and you can think about assets in, in a laboratory, for example, or could also be in a house, could be an oil burner or whatever, um, or in this case, we will use analytic equipment. Then we can look at the whole laboratory as such. The laboratory is part of a building. The building is part of a city. The city is part of a country. Um, the country is part of planet Earth. So you, you can see that you can describe the world over all, across these areas. And, and you can look at spatial aspects and where is something located. You can look at the geometry. Sometimes it's important what a building looks like or what an object looks like in order to fit into another object, for example, and functional, what does the object do? You know, is it a house, are people living there, is it, is it an office or, or is it a, a factory and so on, okay? So the blue boxes here indicate ontologies. I haven't so far mentioned what an ontology is, but it's basically, areas where concepts have been defined so that they can be used in the internet and across uh, which areas they are. So for example, the, the, I showed you the, the, the buildings earlier on that is part of onto city GML. So that has a spatial component, a geometric component and has no functional component. And then there, there is the building information system and you see there is a functional component and then there are aspects that are purely functional um, like this. Um, here, chemical reactions, and so on. So now I will now in 
explain to you a couple or show demonstrate a couple of use cases. So for example, the lab representation, billing management system, and so on. So um, for this, I will be looking also at this robot. So the world avatar is controlling this robot. Uh, so it has to be still uh, loaded by a human who puts in here a lot of liquids. These are the reactants that go into the, into the reactor that you can see here. And um, then here are some other reagent bottles. Um, here are some side reactants. Then um, you have a separation unit, a, a pump, a UV detector, a HPLC, and so on. And now I show you a visual representation um, in the building management system and in the world avatar that um, shows you this lab. So now we fly into Singapore, into our um, um, laboratory. This is our research tower, and this is the laboratory. And although you see this visualization behind the visualization, it's actually the, the world avatar. So the world avatar operates, knows what this is. It knows that this is a flammable liquid cabinet. It has an RFID tag, knows how many bottles in there. And um, now we show you um, a fridge. It knows the power state of that fridge and how much it draws. It also is connected to the building management system. So it's a fully integrated way of lab automation, including asset management and so on. Right, so, so that is what it is, but now I want to move for, for, further forward. And just like you can imagine me sitting here with the full hair, imagine this for a moment, okay? Um, the world avatar can also imagine. So it can create parallel worlds that are on top of the base world. So the parallel worlds are also moving in time. So let's look at one parallel world um, also, you could also call it scenario now. And this brings me to the specific paper that I mentioned before. So look at the UK energy supply trend um, and you will see, okay, oil, natural gas and coal still play enormous role. And um, what we need is to get rid of uh, natural gas and oil, which are mainly used um, in domestic heating, uh, not mainly used, but there is a large part of uh, oil and gas consumption for heating buildings. Okay, the question is, is there an alternative to it? And uh, the key word here is a heat pump, I'm not sure. Um, I think probably some of you are actually into engineers or did thermodynamics when you were little. Okay, then uh, I don't need to explain this, but here, for those who haven't had the chance to sit in a thermodynamic lecture, so here you have a compressor unit, okay, that compresses cool air um, from outside. Um, and through the compression, it gets hot, right? And then um, it's so hot that it can go to a heat exchanger. That is your basically heating, and that heats your, 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 your space. And of course, it is now not as hot, it's now warm, and it goes through an expander, okay, and this is thermodynamics, okay. So through the expander, something that is warm gets cold, and it gets colder than the ambient air outside, and so the ambient air has a chance to heat up the cold and makes it cool. Of course, all that costs electrical energy and um, um, but if the electric energy comes from renewable sources um, it is basically a way to make use of the environmental heat to heat your home of course in addition to the um, electricity you need okay and here below you see two um, examples of heat pumps this is what they look like look a bit like uh, people in Singapore or in China, in hot regions, they, 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 they find this it looks very familiar because um, air conditioning units just work the other way around. And um, uh, so they will have seen this a lot. Okay, good. Now, 
okay, now where we know these wonderful machines exist. Um, so the UK government then thinks, okay, um, the Committee for Climate Change estimates that 19 million heat pumps will need to be installed to reach net zero by 2050. And that inspired the UK government and think, okay, should we have a policy um, to adopt the heat pump, right? And from a carbon reduction point of view, it's of course clear, yeah? and that's, yes, of course, we should, okay? But we didn't do it, okay? So this is a clear, real complex problem because we have to have many, many areas um, that contribute towards the overall problems and you cannot solve the problem ignoring on, on one area but ignoring others. So this is a typical example where the world avatar um, has a potential to contribute. Okay, so now have a look at the UK. So we're looking at the proportion of dual poor households across England by region. And um, you see um, there is a north-south divide, the north lags behind the south. Um, uh, and this is a great, uh, not just for um, few pure households, but um, basically in many other areas as well. Um, that the annual fuel poverty statistics report um, that rural areas in Norfolk, that would be here, and Wales, that is over there, okay, you can't see it, um, as well as the northern areas, the northern areas here is Newcastle and the Northwest, um, have a higher risk of fuel poverty. So what is fuel poverty? Fuel poverty in England is measured using the Lilly indicators or low income, low energy efficiency indicator. So this considers A, the energy efficiency rating of uh, a house, and there are different bands like B, E, F, G, this would be bad. Um, a would be great. Maybe you have seen on your fridge, there is also a rating, this is similar for buildings. And of course, the disposable income. So this income after housing costs and energy needs would be below the poverty line. Okay, so these are basically people who are struggling with their energy bills. So, in so as I said, so for fuel poverty, we have energy efficiency that goes in, energy prices goes in, and income. So in 2019, there were 13.4 percent of households in England. This is 3.18 million households that were classed. Um, fuel poor. That's a lot. And um, so this is one thing we have to have in mind. Another thing is, you know, we want to have these heat pumps um, and then you could argue, are these heat pumps the same all over the country? And then if you did your thermodynamics, you will probably find, oh, no, they are not the same. And one way of characterizing a heat pump is the coefficient of performance, also known as COP. Um, for air source heat pumps. And what you see to the left, you see the coefficient of performance in two different areas, one in the Midlands, okay, and one closer to London. And uh, you can see the typical values, and you can also see that it varies throughout the year. And why is that so? This is highly correlated with the surrounding temperature and humidity. So um, here you can then um, see to the right, this is over here, the mean, minimum, and maximum coefficient of performance and the corresponding air temperature through Great Britain, Great Britain in March 29, right? So <clears throat> the temperature and the coefficient of performance. So what does that now mean? Um, yeah, okay, this is this, name this. Um, so you could then, of course, um, and now we are in the parallel world, we have now deployed in every household in the UK these heat pumps, okay? At the extremes of the parameters, 
the change in cost varied from an increase of approximately 200 pounds uh, per month in the north, right? We're now talking um, in the northeast, for example, uh, to a saving of, of approximately 30 pounds. And now we are here in, in London, okay, in the south. So the transitioning from gas to heat pumps would impose significant changes in fuel costs on household, both on a local and national level. Um, so now you can take this, okay, and look the, at the effect of households adopting heat pumps on social inequality. Okay, so um, clearly this, this, this financial burden um, has an impact on the social inequality index and the social impact of the change in fuel costs is considered in terms of this social inequality index and the negative value of the social inequality index is blue, okay, here blue, negative, and that indicates a decrease in social inequality and due to favorable changes in fuel costs in regions of high fuel poverty. And a positive value rate indicates an increase in social inequality uh, due to unfavorable changes in fuel costs in regions of high fuel poverty. So um, you could argue in, 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 in red areas, the poorer become poorer and the richer becomes richer. And in blue areas, the rich become less rich uh, compared to the poor, they become less poor, right? So, and this is the consequence you see if we rolled out these heat pumps and you see, of course, um, in greater Manchester, you can have people um, where they are positively affected, but at the same time, at the outskirts where people live with very low incomes, um, they will very be negative um, affected by it. Right, so, and now, how did we do this? So an ontology was created to provide a vocabulary to represent fuel poverty data from the UK. Um, and we've already mentioned that pockets exist in Greater Manchester and that there is um, also it can be found in London and that there is clearly uh, increasing fuel poverty um, from south uh, to north. To north. And given the current development of the energy prices, you could imagine that this trend has um, increased um, drastically. So in summary, um, I would like to say that uh, the impact of households adopting as seed pumps differ due to uh, impact of local climate on efficiency and running costs of heat pumps. The results show households in urban regions see some of the lowest decrease in emissions, so it's good for people in cities. And in less dense areas, have pot has potential for some of the largest reduction in emissions. Warmer urbanized areas experience the cheapest transition. And the results also show that there's a decreased north-south gradient in social inequality due to the difference in climate as one moves from north uh, in the UK. And <coughs> northern rural areas which are often compared with colder, experience a twofold disadvantage. So the existing energy use is higher in colder climates and the efficiency of the heat pump is lower. And this is why um, we have observed this difference. So, and this was uh, the parallel world in which we studied uh, the effect of heat pumps. And that is almost the end of my talk, but um, we've been involved in some very exciting work um, where we looked at the question, what if the city close to the sea gets flooded? You know, with climate change, we will see a higher frequency of extreme weather events. And we could ask, of course, what impact will that have to our infrastructure? So we've been using the word avatar along with other groups um, from the Natural Digital Twin Program in the UK. And um, we prepared a small demonstrator video, and this video I'd like to show to you. Now, I'll play a little bit, and please let, let me know whether you can hear something. The Climate Resilience Demonstrator is a climate change adaptation digital quiz. Could you hear that? 
Yes, we can hear it. Great. Let's just stop. Credo, the climate resilience demonstrator, is a climate change adaptation digital twin. The digital twin combines the description of assets from the energy, water, and telecoms networks with data from flood simulations to resolve the effect of flooding on individual assets and the corresponding cascade of effects across the combined network. This example considers a one in 100 year storm and the worst case climate projections. For the year 2070, the depth of flooding caused by the storm is shown in these blue patches. Assets that experienced problems due to the storm are highlighted with red rings. An asset can be selected to view details about it and investigate the cause of failure. In this case, the power state is reported as poor, meaning that the asset is out of service. However, the water depth is negligible so the asset itself is not flooded. To determine the cause of the failure, we can investigate the dependencies of the asset. Here we see that the asset can receive power from one of two primary substations. Despite the apparent resilience in the network, we can see that both primary substations have been knocked offline by deep flood water. The failure of these substations cascades to their dependencies, resulting in further failures across the network. In the future, such digital twins could pull data from other sources, including live streams of data, improving their ability to represent the real world, allowing for more effective decision support across multiple sectors. Credo illustrates what can be achieved by sharing data across sectors and demonstrates how the use of connected digital twins might be used to support better decision making. So, and so this was uh, another example of how can you use the word avatar to create entire worlds and scenario analysis. And finally, I'd like to advertise a book that's just come out. And here I can show you um, this book is on intelligent decarbonization. It covers many aspects of what I said in my talk. It's uh, um, I'm, I have been editing this book together with Dr. Um, Oliver Inderwilde, and um, it contains not only a series of technical articles, but also a lot of interviews from leaders in industry, government, and academia. Um, and yeah, I can recommend it. Um, you probably have it in your library because it's part of the lecture notes in energy um, by Springer. Um, so I think most of the, of the academic libraries have um, a subscription to it. And that brings me now to the end. Um, almost, so I have to um, give credit to the funder, and that is mainly um, CREATE, um, and I would like to specifically highlight Thomas Savage, um, Savage's work and his studentship support from Fitzwilliam College, uh, and I have had support from the Humboldt Foundation, and with that, I have now really uh, come to the end and we have I have spoken for almost 40 minutes. Um, this is maybe a bit faster than I was supposed to, but um, I'm now happy to take questions if you have some. Okay, that's the Professor Kraft. Uh, we have some time for the discussion. Uh, if you have some questions, you can open your mic and discuss with uh, Professor Kraft or just um, uh, type your questions in the uh, chat box and I will uh, read it to Professor Kraft. I, I, um, it would be nice if the people who ask the questions introduce themselves and tell me a little bit uh, what they do and why they why they listen to the, to the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, Professor Krupp, uh, I, have, uh, <laughs> sorry, I have some questions I want to discuss with you. Yeah. Uh, and you have just uh, uh, said that uh, the inequality index used in your, in, in your research. Uh, what's uh, the uh, inequality index used? Sorry, I didn't get you. 
the inequality, uh, the inequality index used yeah. in your research? Yeah. What is uh, yeah. What kind of uh, inequality index uh, used? That's a good question. And to be honest, I would now have to revert you back to the paper. I don't know this from the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm sure we've just used a governmental metric um, and, you know, So I not mm -hmm. one hundred percent sure that a number that is, for example, a wealth Gini coefficient, uh, but I'm not sure whether that's exactly what we've been using in this um, specific case. So sorry. Okay. Okay. I will read it later. And um, uh, the hand pumps you used in your research is only the air source hand pump. Sorry, the the uh, hand pump, the hand pump used yeah. in your research is only, only the air source. source. In our our case, we only looked at air source heat pumps. Um, whether that is a good choice is a different matter. Uh, I think the main reason why air source heat pumps are attractive they are relatively easy to de to be deployed. It's mm -hmm. because this is something that is important for retrofit, you know, yeah. because we need a uh, and, and low capex, right? Mm -hmm. if you have a if you are own, homeowner and you already struggle with your fuel bills, you won't have the money to buy, uh, you know, a different expensive heat pump. Okay, and the heat pump they only use for heating or heating and cooling are all considered cooling. In Cooling in the UK. Have you been to the UK? Uh, yeah, it's uh, you only consider the you know winter case, right? Yeah, but the summer is not that hot. <laughs> there's, no, there's nobody has the air conditioning. I mean, maybe a few hotels or something, but not uh -huh. really. No. Okay. <laughs> it's not a. It's not a. Uh, it's definitely not. A, there are air conditioning, air conditioned rooms in the UK, but that is really uh, very rare. You know, mm -hmm. if somebody from Singapore comes to the UK and they, they want to have an air conditioned room, fine. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> in the sense, in the hotel, but, oh. but a, a, a classic so English family, believe me, they don't have an air conditioned air condition. It's not necessary. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know that. Okay. But maybe in some, uh, such okay. as maybe in some office buildings, uh, they need some cooling. <laughs> You, can you understand what yes. has been said? Yes. I My Chinese is a bit rusty. I, I couldn't quite follow. <laughs> okay. Can we have muted? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, anyone have questions? There's a person called Rui Chu. I, I'm not sure whether I pronounce it. Who is this? Do, does this person know me personally? Because in Singapore we had somebody with that name. Not sure. No. 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 Never mind. No. Okay. Uh, Dr. Chu, if and if there are no questions, it is the time for us to close the seminar. Yeah, yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, thanks to Professor Kraft for your excellent report. And uh, uh, it's time for us to, uh, it is really very, very impressive. Many thanks. Yeah, charge for coffee break. Okay. <laughs> and uh, are, you, are you sitting in, in Sweden? Mm, no, no, I'm not in Sweden. I'm in China now. Ah, okay. Because mm -hmm. had you been in Sweden, I would have said uh, have some canal bulla for me. But um...
So you might see not so China, China. China. I'm not sure with mm -hmm. something at 11. Yeah, so I have something to you or something. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.